Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics. I'm Taylor Phillips, and welcome to Taylor's Detroit Sports on Spreaker. You can also find this and all other episodes of Taylor's Detroit Sports on iHeartRadio. Straight and full Detroit and Michigan sports coverage 100% of the time. If you have any opinions on everything that's going on in the Detroit sports world, call in or send a text message live on the show at 231-429-3668. Also, you can add me on Facebook as Taylor Phillips online at Facebook.com slash TaylorGatorPhillips14. Like my Facebook page, Taylor Phillips' Detroit Sports page. Join my Facebook group, Taylor Phillips' Detroit Sports Group. And follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips with two L's. Welcome to episode 153 on Spreaker. It is also on iHeartRadio. Today we're going to talk about plenty of Tigers, plenty of Lions, plenty of Red Wings, plenty of Lions, and and, uh, plenty of Michigan and Michigan State sports. I got a second here. First, we're going to talk about how the Tiger season has gone. They start eight, eight and two, and, and then they fall to second place in the in the American League Central Division. The Red Wings being knocked out in the first round for the third time in their last four seasons. Gordy Howe announcing the construction of his new international bridge, self-named, and treatments of his stem cells coming up in Mexico next month. The Lions getting their draft picks, acquiring veterans, and hiring three men in the front office, and plenty of Michigan Wolverines, news including Chris Weber, uh, point in the Fab Five documentary, Dennis Norfleet being dismissed, the uh, self-reported NCAA violations for for Jim Harbaugh's first four months at, at U of M, the director of uh, the director of football operations Jim Minnick suspended indefinitely for being arrested for DUI without a charge. Michigan State Spartan and 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 the Michigan State Spartans acquiring a few three-star players. With me this time, with me, I have a co. I have my first co-host uh, ever on Spreaker, and and he is a another podcaster for, for for Detroit sports. His name is Dan Bartley. You can follow him on Twitter at dbart88. Dan Bartley, how are we doing this late afternoon? Pretty good. Uh, let's start off with the Tiger. Tigers here. First off, they start six and zero. Then they, then they take, uh, they, they sweep the Twins four, with four, with a four nothing win, eleven nothing win, and seven to one win. The, the, they absolutely dominated the Twins, and then they uh, sweep the Indians in three epic epic battles: eight to four, nine to six, and eight to five. And then they go to Pittsburgh and take two out of th- the last two out of the, in the first three, uh, uh, the, the last the last two games in the three game series in Pittsburgh against the Pirates at PNC Park. They they come back home and take two out of three from the White Sox. They lose three out of four at home against the New York Yankees. They they come back 
and win the last two of the three-game series at home against the Tribe. They, they go to Minnesota and take two out of three from the Twins. They lose the first two games in Kansas City and win the win the last two in the four-game series. Then, then they lose the first two in Chicago and win and win four to one in the finale. And then they lose the last two of the the last two games in the three-game set against the Kansas City Royals. And finally, they they win two, two of three from the Minnesota Twins yesterday with a 13-1 win. Before that 13-1 win, the, the, their, uh, their, their offense uh, had been struggling since, uh, since May 29th when they racked up 10 wins in Minnesota. They picked up one, two, four, 10, 12, 18, 22, 28, 29, 30, 32, 34, 34, they scored 34 runs in their last In their last night in their in nine games before crushing the twins 13 to 1 especially because Victor Mart especially yeah uh, when, when they had Victor Martinez in the lineup and and Miguel Cabrera and JD Martinez were struggling but JD Martinez lately has been uh, has been uh, hitting the ball again Miguel Cabrera came up huge with two two-run homers and five RBIs Yesterday's game, they they won 13 to one with without without starting Victor Martinez. They they gave Victor the day off, and they, and all of a sudden they they scored 13 runs. And uh, I want your opinion on on uh, on uh, on why uh, uh, well. On, on why they're. Uh, I want your opinion on what on uh, uh, how why and how Victor Martinez has struggled the, th uh, th throughout the season thus far because uh, Victor Martinez uh, was supposed to uh, sit out until opening day, but they react reactivated him in, in late in spring training just to get him going. all about his legs, generates all this power to his legs. With that back leg of his, if you've been watching, I do, uh, they had the Sunday Night Baseball game this past Sunday. They highlighted Victor Martinez. He's not able to pivot and plant his back leg, which generates a lot of his power. He's still, I think he might be a little still bit banged up, or he's just not ready for big league pitching yet. He's not able to turn on the ball. He's not able to stride off on that foot. It's pivotal for a guy who last year had really huge home run numbers. And he's struggling because of this. He's still not ready to go. I think that giving him four days off with the day off yesterday, he's going into a National League ballpark. He's going to sit. He's only going to be coming off the bench. I think it's a good idea. It's a wise idea. I actually talked with a few Tigers beat writers, and he will only be used as a pinch hitter. He will not be coming off uh, playing first base. Playing first base, you're not going to see Biggie at third or anything like that. So also, since I made it clear, he'll be only coming off the bench in the same against the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, yeah, that's a that, that's a very good idea. Victor Martinez, uh, his his back leg, as you pointed out on ESPN, I I remember I I remember seeing that, and that that's been Achilles that's been his Achilles heel. Uh, every time he swings his bat, and and um, he, he 
and he 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 gets uh, he doesn't get enough results, and and that that's that's why his batting average is so low. Up on the heels of uh, the last few great seasons at the plate, uh, they considering considering that they need to uh, give him. Give him those four days, four consecutive days off, especially when the Tigers are in St. Louis taking out a National League team in interleague play where the pitcher has to hit and where there's no designated hitter because there's there's no designated hitter for the American League team to use in, in that series. The St. Louis, St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, Lead, lead the uh, National League Central Division with a record of 24 and 10. Five games back, uh, I mean, five games ahead of the Chicago Cubs. The Cardinals uh, keep playing like they're an elite World Series contender. And the first game starts tonight at 8.15. Tomorrow's game at 2.15 on Fox Sports Detroit, both, both of them. And, and then the 8.05 starts Sunday night on ESPN. Second second uh, consecutive Sunday game at 8.05 on ESPN. And Dan, I... Uh, I want I want you to give me a scouting report on on the St. Louis Cardinals. They have they have former Tigers shortstop Johnny Peralta, who was uh, who two years ago was suspended for fifty games, and and Dombrowski decided to uh, let Peralta go for that. And uh, that 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 also led to the that also caused uh, David left Dave Dombrowski with one option, and that was trade for uh, a, a new shortstop by the name of Jose Iglesias two years ago. And Ig Iglesias was showing his glove two years ago, wasn't showing much of his bat in that in the 2013 season, and and. Um, and then he, and then he got injured for for the 2014 season entirely. He came back in, in 2015, and and this season he he's been really hitting the ball. In addition to to his uh, magnificent, phenomenal plays on defense at shortstop. First off, uh, give give me the scouting report on the Cardinals, and and then give. Give me your opinions on Jose Iglesias. Well, Cardinals are actually have the best ERA in baseball right now, and that is without their ace, Adam Wainwright, who's actually on the shelf all year this year. So that tells you right there how dynamic the pitching staff is for the Cardinals. And like you said, the 24 and 10 record, five games off on the, in the NL Central, it, it's just it speaks margins and how how potent this lineup is. Matt Holliday is the guy that you're going to want to look at in the Cardinals lineup. He's swinging a, a huge stick right now. He's playing well. Having a career year, probably going to make the all-star team. Uh, it, this game is a rematch of the 2006 World Series, which I don't think none of us want to remember. Tigers fans don't want to remember anyway. <laughs> My thoughts on Jose Iglesias is I, I was a fan of Johnny Colt. I really was. He could really hit the ball well. Didn't have the best range playing short. And all that has really changed. The Tigers got kind of exactly what they wanted in Jose Iglesias. He can really kick it in short, turn that double play ball with authority. No one can do it any better. I think Jose Iglesias is probably your, one of your top shortstops in baseball. A guy by the name of uh, Simon that plays for the Atlanta Braves has an intentional two lead throw at him in that top spot. But right now, uh, Jose Iglesias is the guy in my opinion. He's hitting right now, which adds to that, which adds to that sin. Most of the 
time. See a guy at shore. He's not going to throw big numbers. You know, Derek Jeter is retired. That was the guy that put up the big prolific stats as far as batting wise. But the only kids right now, uh, he leads the team in average and also he's playing pretty much every day. He has a few days off here and there. So he just kind of came off that coin and you're right. hopefully he's healed and ready to go. He's actually in the starting lineup tonight. So that's a good sign for the Tigers. I'm looking forward to this series. It's, it's going to be a really good series. Uh, David Price goes tomorrow. He's coming off an injury. The only thing I'm not looking forward to is seeing the Tigers pitchers bat. That, that's going to be just atrocious. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, because uh, the Tigers are are an American League team. Shane Green is uh, an American League pitcher. So is David Price. And, and um, Alfredo Simon uh, uh, played for the Reds last year, and uh, he, he's had he's had a, he's had batting experience at the plate. Uh, but, but, but yeah, that you 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 do prove a good point, Dan. Uh, the the only disadvantage the tiger, the only disadvantage the tigers will, the, the only major disadvantage the tigers will have is uh, their pitchers, batting. Because they're they're an American League team. But. Um, they will bat without Victor Martinez, and uh, the last time that they did it, they they scored, they racked up 13 runs at home. The last time they did that on the road, there was that was in Pittsburgh. They in the uh, in the first two games of that series, they they decided to pinch hit with Victor Martinez, and, and he struck out both times. I would recommend for the Tigers for uh, uh, to uh, sit Victor Martinez for each game in each of those uh, Cardinals games entirely, and 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 see where the offense goes from there. Well, uh, checking on their bullpen, except for Java Chamberlain's uh, meltdown in Chicago. I think it, that statistically it has improved a little bit. Uh, they they have added Tom Gorzolani, at the, and then they added uh, Alex Wilson in the majors, and and Alex Wilson has uh, pitched well statistically, and so has uh, Tom Gorzolani. Yeah, well, not not too great, but not not terrible either. I I think Gorzolani has done pretty well. But uh, Joaquin Soria, 11 out of 11 in save opportunities, and he has thrown plenty of 1-2-3 innings. That's a World Series closer right there. This, uh, this, the, if uh, Soria com comes in to at least one of those, one of those three games in St. Louis, it'll, it, it'll be a test for him. Really, really a cause for concern. 
Yeah, yeah, I have to agree. He, Joe, Joe Nathan uh, may have to retire, uh, uh, pending a, pending his health, and uh, pen, and he, he's already 40, and and uh, last season he blew seven saves. That that's uh, extremely rough. Two more than Ho Jose Jose Valverde blew in 2012. And um, speaking of the bullpen, Bruce Rondon is uh, Bruce Rondon's health has uh, been been getting better. He, last we heard, he threw 15 to 20 pitches in a bullpen session, and, and then which leads to Justin Verlander throwing 25 pitches in in his bullpen session. He has he has felt he has felt no discomfort whatsoever. Yeah, I. I, I think we're, we'll be seeing those two uh, come, coming back uh, to the active roster very soon. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that Rondon is, is a little bit closer than Justin Verlander. I've heard some good things on Verlander, and I've also heard what he has yet to throw his curveball, which is, which is where he actually felt the pinch in his arm the first time when he actually got the injury and throw his curveball. So he's yet to throw his curveball. So once he gets to clear to throw that curveball and the curveball goes off pain free, and the next morning when he wakes up he's pain free, I think that's a good sign. I think that you have, unfortunately, probably right before the All-Star break until Justin Verlander. I don't quote me on that, but that is what I've been hearing. And, you know, the sooner the better with Justin Verlander, but the Tigers staff as a whole has, has been fairly well without Justin Verlander this year. I think Kyle Lofty has been a pleasant surprise for the Tigers going in for Justin Verlander. Well, uh, Lobstein's uh, numbers uh, aren't, aren't quite as uh, good as I expected. Uh, it, most of his uh, rough, uh, most of his outings were uh, rough, but um, it, he had he had a very great outing in, in Chicago in that three-game series at U.S. Cellular Field when the Tigers uh, won that finale four to one. He went eight eight uh, innings even. And, and picked up the win, and Joaquin Soria picked up one of his saves. Uh, he, he went seven and two-thirds innings, did Lobstein, pardon me. Uh, but uh, Lobstein got roughed up at home against Minnesota again. He gave up all six runs. And uh, I, I, I just... I just don't think Lobstein is uh, ready to ready to be a, a starting pitcher yet. When Verlander returns, Lobstein may likely get sent back down to Toledo. That's a really tough tough call right now. The Tigers, Shane Green's had a couple of rough outings. Uh, you know, the Tigers, Green's going at least tonight actually in St. Louis, so we'll see what Green can do tonight against. Very strong match. Uh, Tim's kind of lineup. He's got a hit, so that means he's coming out early no matter what. But I agree with Lobsky. He's been eh, inconsistent, but he's had some flashes of run He's seen some, some potential. You know, I can't complain out of a fifth starter. He's left handed, which makes him valuable as, a, as his own. You know, David Troy is being left handed. You're more valuable than a right handed pitcher. Everybody wants him to lay up the radar gun. That's a big concern. And Verlander has some 
big slang to him, and that's when Justin Brunner is at his best, is when he's a little bit cocky and confident. I think that when Brunner comes back, I think this team will be so much better. I think the staff improved. You can send, as you said, Kyle Lobstein to the Toledo Mudhens, or you can potentially put him in the bullpen and send another guy down, such as John Chamberlain, or whoever the performance level. It's all about who's performing and who's not at that time. I think that plays a big factor. All right, we're already 25 and a half minutes in. We got 20, 19 and a half minutes left in the, on the show. This is a 45 minute episode. Uh, let, let's go on. Let's go on to other other topics. The the Red Wings have reached the Stanley Cup playoffs for the 24th consecutive time, but then they get eliminated by the Lightning in the first round. That's the that's the third time in four in the last four seasons they've been eliminated in the first round. Plus, it's the, sec the sixth consecutive failed attempt to, to reach the conference finals. Uh, with, uh, under uh, Mike Babcock, th their head coach, uh, they're, they're, they, had, they had a goalie controversy between How Jimmy Howard and Peter Morazic, and then it was Peter Morazic in the end taking, taking the number one spot, but but their defense but their defensemen uh, with with a lack of with the very inconsistent play t uh, turning the puck over in their own zone and not blocking their shots uh, has been kill has been killing Howard and Moraz again and the and the entire team they started the first half absolutely well but then in the month of March they 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 like fell to to the uh, to like the last three seeds in the Eastern Conference uh, standings and and they finish with the sixth seed with uh, with a uh, overtime loss to Montreal and then they finish finish strong with a two nothing win a two nothing win in Carolina and, and then when they face the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round they they were up two games to one. They were up two nothing in game four until they gave up two quick goals with, with about uh, four to five minutes to go, and then they lost in overtime, three to two. They they went back to Tampa Bay with a series even. They 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 crushed the Lightning four nothing. They went back home and they fell with a chance to uh, wrap up the series at home in front of their home their own home ice crowd. And they fell flat, five to two. That's like one of many one of many times they failed to clinch a series at home lately. And then they and then they get shut out two nothing in Game Seven to to uh, eliminate get eliminated in from the Stanley Cup playoffs in the first round, just like that. I, in my opinion, they that I think they even though the, even though most fans pick the Lightning. To win the series in e either five, six, or seven games or whatever, I I still thought the Red Wings had a shot to uh, put the series away in five games, but uh, the, but more more but then again I I, I still thought they could have uh, I still thought they could have fin finished the series at home had they not fallen flat either one way or the other game. I think Game Seven should should not have been played. It should not have been taken place in Tampa Bay because I think the Wings had the series right in their hands. Yeah, I completely agree. I I was watching every, every single game. I watched all seven games of the first round between the Wings and Lightning, and it was an up and down series. Your one minute, your your static, your your confident all the Wings are kind of pull off this major upset and everybody picked the Lightning to beat the Wings in the first round. Every NHL expert, even people around in the Detroit area, Detroit News, all the Red Wings getting defeated. And the Red Wings really came out and showed that they're, they're not a team that everybody was picking to lose. They're, they're the underdog, but they're going to come and fight. They're going to take it to Tampa Bay. And they did just that. It just seems like it, there was just a certain points in certain games where the defense just was absolutely terrible. Kane and Kaiser for the whole playoffs took 12 pounding minutes with minus four. 
he seemed like he was just a big log out there. It, it just, he wasn't good. You know, uh, with the suspension, here's a big pivotal game, is with Nicholas Cromwell going down. Arguably one of the wing's best defensemen. With him on a chip, with him suspended for a very questionable hit, which again, is debatable all day, if it's suspension worthy or not. Really didn't play good Back to the defenseman here. What about uh, Brendan Smith and Jonathan Erickson? Smith has been racking up way too many penalty minutes again, just like just like the last two years. And and Jonathan Erickson just kept turning the puck over and uh, not not blocking his shots. That those are uh, two more of the of the uh, two two more concerns that the that the defense has had. Uh, besides uh, DeKaiser and Cronwall, but, well, uh, Cronwall is one, usually one of the best defensemen that, on, on this team. Uh, I, I, I would, uh, as far as the questionable hit is concerned, I would have to disagree because uh, it, Cronwall left his feet and 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 uh, elbowed uh, Nikita Kucherov's uh, head. And, and Kucherov's helmet popped right off. Uh, there was no penalty called, but um, it, it looked like it was injurious, t taking it, which uh, reminds me of Justin Abelkader's hit on Tory Lindman two years ago in the first round when the Wings were taken on the Ducks. They they beat him. They beat him in seven games. Abelkader was suspended for one game, and and Cronwall was suspended for one for one game as well. Kucherov, it, it appeared, was uh, was not injured, but uh, that, that that looked to be a vicious hit. But it was a good hit in the regular season. I think that the way the new NHL is right now, and how kind of soft it's kind of getting, in my opinion, he would have probably gotten two or three games. The playoffs, I think that it's a really debatable topic whether to be suspended or not. At first, I was like, uh, no, I don't think this should be a suspension. And then several books at it, and several different angles, they analyzed it 50 million times on NHL Network and on ESPN. And I agree, I think it, it should be a suspension. I think that he left his feet with a headshot, anything to the head, with a concussion now in professional sports, it's a suspension automatically. Yep, definitely. Um... But, but I want I want your opinions on Brendan Smith and Jonathan Erickson. Uh, Smith needs to cut back on his penalty minutes, and Jonathan Erickson needs to just needs to play more consistently. He he played injured with a broken finger, uh, but which uh, may not be an excuse to me. Uh, what are your takes on on Smith and Erickson? Well, Erickson, Erickson, I want you to tell him lots, and he's a guy that you're yelling at the TV, you're yelling at him the somebody, he's so big out there, and you see the Dale and Chara playing for Boston Bruins, you're like, give me like that guy. He's on the same size. You want Erickson to be more like Chara if you're a Red Wings fan. Erickson needs to step up, lay some guys out. He's got the size, he's got the strength, and he doesn't seem like he uses it. He seems like he's getting beat a lot. You know, you see these guys like uh, Johnson and Stamkos, they're, they're beating him to the puck, they're beating him in the corners. They were able to get around Erickson very well. And with Smith, and Smith's just very inconsistent. Sometimes Smith has some great games. Other times you're watching him turn the puck over left and right. You know, Smith played five games in the playoffs. And he didn't do a single thing. It's, it's the 
Wings defensively have some things to work on, whether if it's drafting this year or if it's trying to um, get a Mike Green from the Washington Capitals or wherever else to win more target. But I know Mike Green is available. Three is right hand shot. He's six foot three. He's young. He's, he's a very good player. So the Wings are going to take a look at the defense, and I think that's who you want to target. I think that is the Achilles heel with this Red Wing team is the defense. About nine and a half minutes left. Uh, let's uh, fit in Mike Babcock for a little bit. Uh, my, I just got an update that Mike Babcock will will determine whether he will sign with the Red Wings or sign elsewhere by May 22nd. Uh, ch chances are Mike Babcock may go to Toronto and play with the Maple Leafs or go to Buffalo and play with the Sabres. The Penguins have no interest in Babcock, plus the Oilers are expected to hire Todd McClellan as their new head coach. Assuming the San Jose Sharks uh, are looking for a, for a head coach, they they might want Mike Babcock as well. I want your take on that. I think if Babcock's a very intelligent guy, he goes to a team like Buffalo and, and stays away from the, the hot hotbed that is Toronto. I think that Toronto is where everybody wants him to be. You know, it's, it's Toronto. He can turn that franchise around. He can get things straightened out. Possibly, but he's got to have the tools to work with. Tron wants to trade away Phil Kessel. They have a goaltending situation. They have a lot of in house issues. Brendan Shanahan just took over the team now. There's a lot of issues. I think that if Mike Bancock was smart, he would either stay with Detroit or sign with Buffalo and try to rebuild that franchise. If, if I were a coach in the NHL right now, I would want to go coach Edmonton. Edmonton, that you're the most approved. And you have a lot of talent that you can juggle. You're going to get Connor McDavid in the draft. You already have Taylor Hall, Jordan Eberle. You have some good defensemen. You have a lot that you can work with. And I think Babcock is going to end up with probably Toronto. And it'll probably be one of the greatest mistakes that he'll ever make in his life, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, he's going to go with the, where his heart desires. If he wants to go coach the Toronto Maple Leafs team and try to make the playoffs, then he's going to do just that and try to prove everybody that Toronto is still in contention. His decision coming up soon, uh, his, his uh, bad line changes with the Red Wings, um, allowing the other team to break away and score is uh, one of the disadvantages uh, lately that lately the Wings have been having with Mike Babcock. Some of the players don't, don't like him, but uh, we, we've got... Uh, Seven minutes to go. Why don't we go? Why don't we go to the Lions real quick? <coughs> Recapping the NFL draft, the Lions uh, drafted guard, offensive guard Lakin Tomlinson in the first round. Drafted second round running back Ab Amir Abdullah from Nebraska. Cornerback Alex Carter. Fullback Michael Burton. Cornerback Quandre Diggs. And offensive tackle Corey Robinson, and and then they signed 12 undrafted free agents. Signed Amir Abdullah to a four-year, 4.16 million dollar deal. Then they then they signed veteran wide receiver Lance Moore. Uh, they signed wide receiver Greg Salas, cornerback Chris Owens, and and then they and then they signed. Uh, Defensive lineman Corey Wooton from the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, what's your take on the Lions thus far? Leonard Sue is a big, 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 big problem. I think that automatically you lose Sue, I think you lose one of the best players on your team. It's like losing Stafford. Stafford is a debatable thing for another time. I think they did a great job of drafting. I think this is one of the better drafts that the Lions have put together in several, several years. I think the number one pick, Lincoln Thompson, from Duke is a class act. It's a really interesting pick. It, it really is the Lions' favorite guards. Uh, Tomlinson is a people mover and, and a guy that who can finish. I, I watched a couple of the games he played with Duke. And I like what I see. He's a big guy. He's a very intelligent guy. He's really got his back together. You're not going to see him in the off-field situations that 
young Lions players are famous for. You want to stay out of those bad situations, those nightclubs, and those bars, and those Lions. That's, that seems to be an issue as of late for the Lions. I, I really do like the Lions as a whole. Amir Abdullah, the running back from Nebraska, is a solid pick. I, would, I uh, wrote a blog and I said the Lions draft class and this year was a B plus. I'm really, really high on the, on the draft. All right, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, moving on to the Michigan Wolverines news here. Um, Chris Webber uh, argued about the Fab Five documentary. Jalen Rose uh, 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 blasted, blasted back at him. Webber uh, pointed out that, they, that it was their fault. Rose uh, and uh, Jimmy King on the Ryan and Rico show on Detroit Sports 1051 disagreed with Weber and told them it was Weber's own fault and and then uh, the Michigan Wolverines football program has reportedly dismissed but then suspended wide receiver Dennis Norfleet and and they report and they report themselves for four secondary NCAA violations for Violations for Jim Harbaugh's first four months at the school, and and their director of football operations and a, and assistant athletic director Jim Minnick suspendedly in suspended and suspended indefinitely for being ar arrested for DUI, and he was not charged for that. And and then the Michigan State Spartans uh, acquiring uh, uh, or recruiting like five or six three-star players. You got, you got, you got less than three minutes. Uh, uh, I think Northfleet it was, it was a heck of a talent. And, and if, he, if he does return for a senior season in Michigan, that'll be a huge blow to Michigan. The big thing, the big story right now is Jim Harbaugh. And the four months that he's been here, there's been lots of controversy already. You know, he's he's treated like he's really royalty, and, and he's the biggest signing in college football history, more than likely. You know, a lot of people are already considering him to be the best coach, and he's not done a thing yet for this team, in my opinion. So you want on the field, the only thing that matters is wins and losses. Brady Hoke, great guy, class act. Met him myself. Great guy. Has, didn't do a thing, though. That is the thing, that is what I care about with this Michigan football team. Is that record is still 0-0. Zero zero. I don't see no five-star recruits here. Harbaugh, four year, four months into this Michigan comeback, it, it's shaky right now. There's lots of issues that need to be worked out, and hopefully it doesn't become a distraction. If you want to see this team succeed this year. And what about the Michigan State Spartans uh, re recruiting uh, three-star offensive lineman Lacusa, uh, rec recruiting uh, Gavin Cup and and other other players. I think Michigan State is going to have another good year. I, I really do believe that State's going to be another top, top team. And I, a lot of people don't want to hear that, that are big U of M fans. And, and the main thing is, is the Michigan-Michigan State game every year. That's what Michiganders want to see. And they want to see Harbaugh beat, beat the Spartans. Because, you know, it's go blue or go green here in the state. And I think that Michigan State has a better team going in and looking at the rosters right now. It's debatable, like everything is in sports, but Michigan State doesn't have the issues that Michigan does right now. And that is a big question. No one's talking about what Michigan State's doing off the field right now. Michigan has all kinds of controversies and all kinds of issues, and that plays a big, big factor in what team shows up on the field. All right, we're... We're, we're under a minute left. Uh, we're gonna have to uh, we're have to end the call and end, end the end the podcast. Uh, Dan, I Dan, I thank you for being on here. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yep, thank you. Thank you for the call. And that does it for Taylor's Detroit Sports episode one fifty three. Well, that about wraps it up for now. Head out. I'm Taylor Phillips, TT fan, talk, talk for now.